thank you. Uh, yeah, GeoTiffJS, uh, efficient GeoTiff exploration in the browser. So GeoTiffJS is actually a project that's quite dear to my heart. I've been working on it and in collaboration with many, many others for some time now. So I'm really happy to have a talk about it here. Um, first, a quick, uh, quick outline. Um, I'll do, do it like Daniel. So I'd like to ask you who, who knows about GeoTiff. Okay, the other way around, who does not really know about GeoTiff? Okay, <laughs> okay, not, no really, okay. Um, I see, so you're all very informed. I will bore you with the details anyhow. Um, first, there is, a, there is a thing called the header, which is basically the first part of your GeoTiff, and then there's a linked list of all the IFDs uh, of the image, since a GeoTiff is actually com can be comprised of many images. They are all organized in so-called IFDs. They store the metadata for the particular image, and they have references for the image data. Um, there is no actual inherent structure required. Um, who of you has a computer science background? Okay, quite some. So uh, when, when we, at least when I learned in computer science about linked lists, this is basically the worst performance structure there is. Uh, maybe you have a similar opinion about that. Uh, but this is actually where, the, where Cloud Optimized GeoTiff comes in and really improves on that. Because Cloud Optimized GeoTiff uh, says, well, it's just TIFFs, but we basically define how it is internally structured. So you have the head in the beginning, and then you have immediately the IFDs in a particular order, and then you have the image data. Um, I'm, it is way more efficient, and I will talk about, oh, at least if you have a reader that is, that is taken, that is, Take it, takes advantage of that. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, how GeoTiffJS is making advantage of that. All right, so what actually is GeoTiffJS? So it is a pure JavaScript reader and also writer for cloud-optimized GeoTiffs. So I, I put this in parentheses because I will come back to that later because there's actually more usages other than the GeoSphere for that. It aims to be feature complete, whatever that means. I mean, the TIFF spec is basically fixed for like 20 years now, but there's several extensions. For example, GeoTIFF is an extension to TIFF, and now Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF adds small bits and pieces. But there's some evolution, so um, I guess many of you have seen uh, events talk about GDAR, so you all know there's a new uh, compression algorithm now that we have to implement in GeoTIFF.js, and I'm really looking forward. Uh, pull requests are welcome, actually. Um, and it, it also aims for, for efficiency. So um, I come from the uh, computer science background, so efficiency is also very close to my heart. And then there's also the, the, the great deal of, of ease of use. So I want to make it as, as open and uh, easy to use for anyone to use it. Um, but I also want to give um, some, I, I call it expert functionality, so some functions that are really there for expert users who really want to exploit it and really want to get the best performance, the best, the best information out of your, of your images. It also aims to be extensible, coming back to the compression thingy. This is actually something that you can provide as plugins, so <laughs> I hope that, yeah, I said already, pull requests are welcome. And GeoTiffJS was really, really lucky because the initial commit was 2015 and right after that something happened. Um, it really took off. So it, it was really unexpected, but some, somehow GeoTiffs and Cloud Optimist GeoTiffs were back in en vogue and everyone was using it. So GeoTiffJS was really lucky to be in the right spot at the right time. Right, uh, I'd like to talk a bit about the architecture and what actually makes it um, efficient, or at least what I consider efficient. Um, you have abstraction classes, so it's easy to understand. So you have an abstraction class of a GeoTiff. There's also an abstraction class that uh, uses multi-GeoTiffs, so this is uh, somehow useful for cases when you have the overviews, so like the smaller resolution images in an external image, so this is a common use case. So this, for, this class, uh, for this case, we have the multi geotiff class. And then a level beneath that, which is actually abstracting the IFDs that we have talked about earlier, is the GeoTiff image. Um, you can see here, um, this is actually, I would consider the expert API to you know. So, so you basically have to construct the source, which is an abstraction on, on where it is. Then you can uh, construct the GeoTiff from that source. 
But there's actually an, an easy way to use it, which is just this from URLs. If you know, if you because 90% of the time you're basically loading it from some web server, so this is the, the fast track to that. And then you can actually access the, the image beneath that. Um, there's, since there can be more, you can also pass in the index. Right, doesn't work. There it is. Okay, um, next thing we already touched upon is the source. So this is actually, the, uh, it stands in between, between, um, between your TIFF and uh, GeoTIFF.js. So you, when your TIFF is uh, stored in some HTTP service, some S3, maybe it's a local file, maybe it's something that you want your user to be able to drag into your browser. It's a blob or something. So this is the source, this is the abstraction that allows you to, to ac actually access the raw, the raw byte data underneath. For the most common use cases, we already provide the sources, as we've already seen. For example, the HTTP source um, has some uh, tip tricks that we are actually using. So for example, so since, um, so HTTP has a concept called range request, when you just want to get portions of the image. When you just send a get request to a resource, you will always get the full, rec full, um, the full file. But for huge uh, GeoTIFFs, you don't actually want it because it can be in the, in the order of like gigabytes. And you don't want to download those at, at once. Um, so you're using range requests in order to uh, just get portions of the file. And since you're using GeoTIFFs, you actually know which portions you're actually interested in. Um, there's also the, a possibility, if you know ahead which portions of the, of the file you're interested in, you can also make a multi-range request which combines multiple uh, ranges of, of the files that you're interested in and you get back a single multi-part thing. GTFJS supports that, so you can even scale down the amount of requests that you uh, are actually needed to send because you can, even if you're, you're disjointed sections of the file you want to access, you can download them in a single request. Uh, there is a caveat. Uh, the caveat is that not every web server actually supports it, so this is an opt-in feature, uh, so you have to provide it um, in, in this max ranges um, uh, setting. Right, um, then there's, there's something uh, which comes back to, a, to a, a topic that we just had in the previous talk. Yes, GeoTIFFJS does cache. Um, and this is the, the so-called blocked source that we're using. So this is basically a wrapper across, uh, so a wrap around any source um, that's there. So for example, you can put it inside the, uh, in front of your S3 source or HTTP source. So it basically wraps this, uh, this source in this blocked source. So you are having a block cache, which is very, very good because sometimes you just um, you just don't want, you may, may need to read a block uh, twice or multiple times, and this way you, you, have the, you have the block already cached. So it's good for performance and it's good for transmission of data. Uh, it uses an LRU cache, which is a least recently used cache. So um, in, in order to not bust your, your, your computer's memory, um, you can say I only want to store them the, the 100, uh, recently used uh, blocks, so you don't run out of memory uh, anytime soon with that. Um, again, there's, you, can, you can do it like this. You can construct your HD remote source and then wrap it in a blocked source. Uh, but again, it's easier if you just use the, this constructor function and then you have it um, as is because yeah, it's easier that way. Right, uh, then we're talking about actual raster access. So the, how, how do you actually get the, the raster data for your images? And there is actually two ways uh, to do it because one is just dealing with the raw data and since TIFFs can also, are also fairly often used in order to store RGB data, there's also a second way called uh, read RGB. Um, again, you can simply call the, the, the simple function with no options, then you will get all the data in, in just one go. But you can provide it with many, many options if you're so inclined. So for example, with the window, you can specify the image window you want to read out of. You can also specify the width and height. In this case, it will resample. You can also specify that you just want, uh, you're just interested in, in, in one or two bands of it. Um, you can also specify if you want to have the image data interleaved or you want to have it in separate arrays. So all of that you can, you can, you can specify. 
Uh, the read RGB method is, is very similar in a sense because it's actually built on top of the read raster, but it does some uh, calculations uh, for you because there's multiple color spaces, there may be a color map that's inside of the TIFF. So you, when you're just interested in the RGB values and nothing else, you can call that and it will do uh, a lot for you. Um, there are several options that you can actually provide, but it may also be interesting to see what you don't need to provide because it's sometimes interesting what, you, what, what the library actually does for you. Okay, and what, it, what you don't have to supply is uh, many uh, stuff which is stored in the TIFF and GeoTIFF.js can, can make use of. So is it in tiles or stripes? What's the internal compression? Is there a predictor applied or not? Um, is it pixel interleaved, so the data inside the TIFF, or is it stored in, in, in planar uh, configuration? Um, does it have internal overviews? Does it have overviews at all? Um, does it use color spaces other than RGB, and, or does it use color tables? So all of this is, is taken out of your hand. You don't have to deal with it, and it makes it automatic. So again, it's, it's, it's easy to use for, for uh, non-knowledge people, which is, which is good for, um, for spreading the word, basically. Right, um, another important thing is the, the decoding. So this is the, the, the part where GeoTIFF.js is actually um, somehow using a, a plugin based system because uh, there's a, a finite set of, of already specified uh, compression algorithms that, you're, that you can use. But uh, as we have seen today, uh, it's, it's always possible that a new one gets, uh, gets invented and it will be uh, there and you have to support it. So you can simply define your own codec, so your own compression algorithm uh, or implement one and then you, can, then you need to specify the number in, under which it shall be, um, shall be registered. So this is then looked up by the, by the thing inside of the, of the GeoTIFF. So this is, this is the reason why it's, why it's um, actually composable and extensible. Um, decoding, uh, decompression is really CPU heavy. So th this is why we implemented it in, in threads uh, or web workers, how they're called in the web uh, platform. So uh, you can use it, um, so you, you can, this is what's, what's beneath there. You can create a GeoTIFF pool, which is a web worker pool, a thread pool, and uh, when you pass this pool to the, to the read raster function, uh, you make use of um, multiple CPUs, and so it's, it can speed up a lot the, 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 the image decoding. Um, there is one, so sometimes you have to use the tricks because I am lazy and I, I, I am also bad with maths, and compression is usually dealing with maths a lot. Um, so you have to be really, really ingenious in order to make use of what is already there. And for the life of me, I could not find a decoder, a decompressor for the WebP format. So I'm actually constructing um, an image, a browser image, and just load the, the tile of the TIFF directly inside of this, inside of this uh, browser image, and then read the bytes back out of it. So it uses the browser cap capabilities, so this is why it's not usable on Node.js, for example. Right. So that was basically all the features and uh, uh, the GeoTIFF comprised of. Um, I'd like to talk more about the GeoTIFF, the open source project. Um, we have, so when I started it, I based it off some, some project that someone else wrote, so it was basically, as I said, at the right time, at the right place. But now there's more than uh, 35 contributors. In just in the past year, there were 50 merged pull requests. And uh, something interesting happened. Uh, so there were less and less requests for new features, but more shift towards maintenance. So more like uh, bug reports um, for this does not happen, this, this, this should be done this way, and so on. Um, so I've seen a curve of adoption of GeoTIFF.js in various frameworks. And every time this happens, I get back a slew of, of, um, of bug reports and issues, and it's, it's a really valuable information to see how it's actually being adopted and where the pain points are still are. But it's somehow um, 
gives me the impression that I think it might be come to a spot where it's actually done because there's no additional feature that you can implement apart from new compression algorithm. Pull requests, welcome. Um, I'd, um, so there's many downstream projects. So quickly go ahead. So this is just what I pulled from npm.js. So we have uh, 47 dependents. Uh, I don't know them all. I know some of them, and they're all cool and great. But uh, the one I really fell in love with was the open layers integration because it's like done really, really well and ties into their ecosystem. So it's been adopted by open layers since version 6.7. But we've seen that there's also many, many other non-geo um, applications where this is used. So for example, if one is a medical application where it can view uh, body scans um, of some sort or, or, or um, I think uh, microscopic images, which is also a really cool use case. Right, um, 2016 I wrote this, this uh, small app which is the, called the Cog Explorer, um, which was for, built for a version of, of open layers which was um, really old and it was not really well to be integrated. So we made a custom WebGL render pipeline and did one hack after the other just to make it work. In the end it worked nicely and you can still use it. Uh, it's not updated since then really. But it basically had 700 lines of, of, of complete awfulness. So it's, it's really, really bad. Don't look into it. Um, but now, uh, the last year, I wrote this, this small app, which is called, I call it a dem app, because you basically can visualize a dem. Uh, it's built using the quite modern version of, of open layers. And um, just quickly go forward. This is all the code I needed to, to load the GeoTIFF. You, so you basically provide the URL to your TIFF and, and, and that's basically it. And this is like, it was really awesome. Uh, what you can do, you can load a DEM inside of this web view and you can basically define a couple of random modes, so shaded contours, slope shade. And then you have some of these, these nice sliders on the right hand side and you can, you can see how the image is changing. This is a, a, a GIF that I just, um, that I just recorded. It, it, it's, it, it feels really chunky. If you do it yourself, you see it's butter smooth. It's not because of GeoTIFF, it's because uh, OpenLayers is awesome. And it's really easy to set up and comprehensive. Right, um, what now? Yeah, as I said, it's, I would consider it somehow feature complete. I, I, I like that it's going more and more in the back end. It's, it's, it's adopted by many projects, but it's going also more and more in the back end, and I'm happy for that. Um, and every time there's an adoption, I get feedback, which is also really great, so we can um, work out the last jinks that uh, there might be, so the last, uh, last issues there might be. Um, there's always ideas to, to throw everything in the garbage and start anew. We don't do that, no, of course. Um, there's, uh, there's ideas for refactoring. Um, so there's uh, some experience that we learned over time how, how we could make the architecture simpler and, and better. And since JavaScript is that, 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 that fast of an ecosystem, it's always easy to say, OK, I should have done this or that. Um, and also, I think that the last talk has hinted at it. So there is a, no, um, it's, it's, I think it's, I uh, feel it's starting. There's an, a broader JavaScript Rust data ecosystem happening. And now even the, 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 the lines between front end and back end browser and server is, is starting to blur, which is also really cool. So I, I think there's a way to like, um, thank you. Um, yeah, like, emerge and, uh, and, and, and uh, something is happening. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And yeah, I'd, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions.